Well, speaking of great things, we've started a series on our unity principles, our five basic unity principles, and I think most of us are familiar with them. You know, when I first heard the five principles, I thought they were as old as the unity movement itself, when, in fact, they're only about 20 years ago. They were created uh, for an article in Unity magazine where they wanted to try to summarize our unity teachings, and uh, the biggest challenge, really, was to come up with something that wasn't too simplistic and which wouldn't turn into a, a, a rigid and dogmatic statement of faith or a creed or a catechism that everybody had to, had to memorize and profess and recite and things like that. And uh, they, did a really, they did a really good job. And we're going to start with the first principle today. And uh, the first principle was originally worded like this. God is absolute good everywhere present. That's what you call short and sweet. And it's loaded with meaning because if you ponder what each and every one of those words are really getting at, you get into some, you get into some very deep realizations. You know, I, I mentioned last week that um, these aren't written in stone. Unity Ministries, go online and check out the websites of other Unity Ministries. You will find different words, different ways of saying these things that still manage to maintain the integrity of the original. And one of the ways that this, um, that this principle has been restated is this slightly expanded version, which I kind of like. It says, God is the name that we give to the source and essence of all that is. There is no other enduring power. Another way you may have heard it is, um, uh, is this familiar affirmation, which says there is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, or as the universe and as my life, God the good omnipotence. You know, whichever, whichever way you say it, it's straightforward and it is uncompromising. One presence, one power. God is the source and essence. God is absolute good everywhere present. One power, not two powers, not one and a half powers. <laughs> one power doesn't leave any room for you know who. Satan, the devil, the prince of darkness, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and that's a major difference between the unity movement and other, and other spiritual movements or denominations. We have never believed in the existence of any independently operating, call it a, a force of evil or an evil spirit or an evil supernatural being. And, and there must have been a time, though, when you think about it, there must have been a time when human beings really needed something like Satan in order to explain why bad things happen to good people. You know, God wouldn't punish a truly good person. So there had to be something else at work in the world to explain why good people suffered. And so they came up with this idea that there's another force out there. Um, and of course, that just creates more problems and more questions. Because if there's this other evil force operating out there, you know, if, if, if God is all-powerful, then why can't God control this Satan guy? If God couldn't control Satan, then that means that God can't be all-powerful. Or, if God could control Satan, but chose not to, well, then that means that God isn't particularly good or benevolent. So, over the years, you know, I've come to believe that Satan, or the devil, or whatever you want to call it, is just a convenient excuse that human beings came up with in order to avoid responsibility, whether it's individually or, uh, or collectively. Anyone remember this guy here, Flip Wilson? Anybody remember Flip Wilson, the Flip Wilson show? This is actually one of his album covers, one of his comedy album covers, that I actually had this in my collection. Flip Wilson. And remember Geraldine, he played Geraldine, and he kept saying, the devil made me do it, right? He says in this one, the devil made me buy this dress. <laughs> and 
from the looks of that dress, I'd believe that, you know. But yeah, you know, but we got to give. It was the '60s, right? I mean, that was fairly common back in the '60s. Yeah. So you've got the excuse, the devil made me do it. Or if if you're too young to remember Flip Wilson, maybe you remember this person. Do you remember the church lady from Saturday Night Live, Dana Carvey? She'd get on with her show called Church Talk. <laughs> Anytime something bad would happen in the world, she would question, why did that happen, and why is this happening? And then she would say, Could it be? Again, there you go, that, that convenient scapegoat. You got something to blame it on. We don't have to take responsibility. Um, it's that other guy. So I think it makes a lot more sense to take a look at our own consciousness, to take a look at our own choices, to take a look at our own way of viewing the things that happen in the world instead of looking for excuses when bad things happen in the world. And, and fortunately, humankind is gradually outgrowing the need for this idea of Satan. Um, there was a, a national poll, this was taken back in 2001, um, that showed that only 27% of Americans still believe that Satan is a real being who can influence people's lives. Yeah, 27%, that sounds like a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to affirm that if we took that same poll today, it would be smaller even. It, it just goes to show, though, that you know, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, when they, were, um, when they were doing away with this whole idea, they were, they were way ahead of their times. So, okay, the first principle means no Satan. And I think, hey, most of us can live with that, right? We, we don't need no stinking Satan. You know, that, that's, we're, 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 we're done with that. But maybe, maybe some of you might be wondering why my version of the first principle left out the word good. That second version I shared with you left out the word good. Well, think about it. Good is kind of a funny word, isn't it? What's good for me isn't always necessarily good for you. What seems good today isn't necessarily good tomorrow. You can get too much of a good thing, and that can be bad. Sometimes people really try to do good, but they end up doing it badly. So, you see what I mean? It gets into a, it gets into a, a, a real exercise in, in, in splitting hairs sometimes. And uh, there, there's a story that, that illustrates this. There's a, a Taoist story of an old farmer, and this old farmer had worked his crops for many years. Well, one day his horse ran away. And upon hearing the news, his neighbors came to visit, and they said, such bad luck, they said sympathetically. Maybe, the farmer replied. The next morning, the horse returned, bringing with it three other wild horses. How wonderful! What good luck, the neighbors exclaimed. Maybe, replied the old man. The following day, his son tried to ride one of the untamed horses, was thrown, and broke his leg. Guess what the neighbors said? They came to offer their sympathy on his misfortune, saying, that's too bad. Maybe, said the farmer. The day after, military officials came to the village to draft young men into the army. Seeing that the son's leg was broken, they passed him by. The neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good fortune and how well things had turned out. Maybe, said the farmer. You know, you just, you just never know. We have to be careful about how we throw the word good around. That beautiful sunny day that we enjoy here in California creates a mass of warm air or hot air that moves east, runs into a mass of cold air, and we get the tornadoes that we've been hearing about from the Midwest that have been happening over the course of this week. And I've said before, the same energy that drives the wind and the waves and causes things like tornadoes and storms to come into existence is the same energy that sustains life on Earth. It's the same energy that holds the planets in their orbits. It's the same energy that gives birth to the stars. It's the same energy that gives birth to us, that gives birth to all life. It's one presence, 
one power. A couple of years ago, um, I came across the work of a fellow named Thomas Berry. He was a, a Catholic priest, and he was also a scientist, and he specialized in cosmology and studying the origins of the universe and its mysteries. And uh, one of the quotes that made a really big impression on me was uh, from something he wrote called 12 Principles for Understanding the Universe. And he said this, the universe has a violent as well as a harmonious aspect, but it is consistently creative in the larger arc of its development. I love that. He's inviting us to look at the big picture. Yes, there's chaos. Yes, there is, yes, there is suffering. You know, our task, our challenge is to pay attention and to, to learn how to work within that consistently creative, larger arc of the universe. We don't have to ignore the other stuff. We feel our feelings and we acknowledge that there is pain and there's suffering. And there's, and there's loss in the world, and then we shift our focus to the truth that the universe is in this constant state of, of change and evolution, and that each moment is unfolding and leading to a greater expression of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Each step of the way, we have the opportunity in all circumstances to expand our circle of, of caring and compassion, and to me, that is the definition of absolute good, being one with that creative arc that's unfolding and being able to expand our circle of caring and compassion no matter what's going on around us. You know, our, our beliefs are powerful. What we focus on grows. Our beliefs are powerful because they determine our actions. That's why our first principle is so important because in the midst of whatever, whatever kind of evil, if we want to call it that, or chaos, or bad stuff, if we want to call it that. Whatever is going on in the world, we affirm that God energy, that, that the creative arc always, always prevails. Human beings bond together in marvelous ways. They pitch in to help each other out when things like those tornadoes happen in the Midwest. It brings us together sometimes like nothing else, and it's too bad that it takes something like that sometimes, but it just goes to show where our hearts and our spirit lie in those situations. That's the way that good prevails. Now, you know, natural disasters, they're, they're, they're one thing. Um, I typically don't call natural disasters evil. Although if you've ever seen a tornado up close and personal or been through one, you know, the word does come to mind. They are scary, they seem evil, but you know what, they just are. I tend to want to reserve the use of the word evil to describe the consequences of human conduct. Human beings who use their freedom of choice to inflict suffering on other people, people who use their or misuse their freedom of choice to feed their egocentric greed, that's properly called evil. That kind of evil ultimately collapses under its own weight. It's not sustainable. You know, we can try to fight it, and sometimes the only ethical thing that we can do is to stand up and take action to, to stop those things from happening but ultimately it's self-defeating. We may be able to nudge it, you know, like you're you know, tipping a tree over after you've cut the notch in it. We may be able to nudge it a little bit, but it's, it's its own inherent limitation that brings about its end. Evil is maladaptive. It doesn't sustain life. It doesn't add anything to that larger creative arc of the universe. You know, think about some of the worst perpetrators of genocide in our history. You know the names, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, evil that was so great it just simply was not sustainable. What they tried to do collapsed under its own weight. Charles Fillmore said something really, I, I think, very profound about evil. He said that evil is a parasite. It has no permanent life of itself. Its whole existence depends on the life that it borrows from its parent or the life that it sucks from its, from its parent. <laughs> and guess who the parent is? Well, that would, be, that would be us if we let it, if we allow it. But if we think of the universe in terms of one presence and one power, then we have the privilege 
to use that God power for that which we call good. Or, if you'd rather, we can use that power to stay in alignment with the creative arc of the universe and, again, to expand our circle of caring and compassion. When we think and act in alignment with, with that one presence and one power, that's when we nurture and affirm life. When we choose to act separately, when we choose to ignore the one presence and one power, that's when we're capable of doing harm to ourselves and doing harm to this planet. Okay, well that brings us to a, another part of our first principle that is often changed. And it has to do with the word God. Now, now let's face it, the word God has some baggage for a lot of people, doesn't it? I'm convinced that most people who call themselves atheists are simply rejecting a worn out childhood concept of God and they have yet to find anything more meaningful to take its place. I truly believe that. This next slide here shows a, a beautiful work of art. You might recognize this as one of Michelangelo's paintings on the Sistine Chapel showing, showing God in the act of creation. And here's another picture, a similar one. You know, God is the guy with gray hair and the beard who sits up in the clouds. Some people have an idea that that's what God is really like. Human beings at one time must have had that idea or they wouldn't have turned it into these kind of paintings. And for a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people that no longer works. And just because you no longer believe in the bearded supernatural guy in the sky doesn't mean that you're an atheist. What it means is that we're evolving. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That can be an uncomfortable place, though, can't it? Anytime we're in transition, especially when it comes to beliefs that we've deeply held, maybe since childhood, it can be uncomfortable. The transition between a worn-out concept and our emerging and evolving understanding of the universe. One of the ways to deal with the discomfort is pick another name for God. There's lots of them out there. Try a principle, spirit, the one, the universe. There's a bunch of others. Pick the one that works for you. And we have to accept the fact that we are not going to erase the word God from our collective vocabulary. It ain't going away. So that means that there are times when we have to learn how to reframe what we hear. We hear the word God. We need to have that experiential picture of the word and the concept that's most meaningful to us. And that's especially true when, we, when it comes to some of the songs we sing or some of our art and poetry. You know, nobody wants to erase the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That is a beautiful, beautiful work of heart art. It's part of, our, it's part of our history. We're not going to erase the word God from all of our songs and all of our literature. But the thing is that the literal image has nothing to do with the truth behind it. You know, that, that beautiful picture on the Sistine Chapel that was the result of an experience that that particular artist was trying to convey at that point in time. And no matter what experience we have, we're going to translate it. We're going to filter it through our own personality. We're going to filter it through the culture that we live in. We're going to filter it through the theology that we were brought up with. And that's what happens. So our challenge, our task is to dig deeper. We want to get beyond the personality. We want to try to go behind the theology and the culture and get at the actual experience that gave rise to that image, that word, that picture. We want to get closer to the truth. You know, one of the oldest books in Unity that's been in continuous print is one called Lessons in Truth by H. Emily Cady. And most Unity folks have this in their library and they've read it at some time or another. She wrote this in the 1890s, and she had a way then of, of getting close to the truth that I think still really, really works well today. This is how Emily Cady invites us to reframe our concept of God, to try to find a new word that can go along with our experience. She says, God is spirit or the creative energy that is the cause of all visible things. 
God as spirit is the invisible life and intelligence underlying all physical things. I think even a scientist could, could get on board with, with, with that idea. God is not a being or a person having life, intelligence, love, power. God is that intangible but very real something we call life. Or she goes on to say that, that God isn't a being that has power. God is power itself, that kind of thing. She says, God is the name that we give to that unchangeable, inexorable principle at the source of all existence. All of those from Lessons in Truth. God is just one of many names that we use to describe the one, to describe the, the source of all existence, to even describe existence itself, to describe the, the scientific and physical laws that underlie the universe and everything that flows from it. And this leads rather nicely into our second principle, because if there is an intelligence and one orderly power that gives rise to existence itself and all physical things, then that means it also gives rise to each and every one of us, which has some very important implications for what it means to be human. And that's going to be our topic for next week. Hope you all can be here. God bless you. Thank you.